Well, good morning, folks. It's good uh, to see you gather out uh, here this morning as we come uh, to worship God. You're all very welcome uh, here to this, uh, our service of worship uh, in Glen Dermot. If you're visiting with us, we extend you a special welcome. I know it's one or two visitors, so it's good to have you with us. Um, We do trust that you will know something uh, of our sense of family and fellowship and indeed God's blessing as we meet uh, to worship God uh, together. You will have received a copy of the announcement sheet on the way in. As you know, at this time of year, things have quietened down a little bit. There's not so much uh, happening, but uh, there are one or two things worthy uh, of note there. There is uh, the new uh, year, the the watch night service in Everington at 11.30 on Tuesday. Did you get this right? Tuesday evening. Um, You'll all be made more than welcome at that there. You know that's a joint service between uh, the four uh, main churches here uh, in the waterside, so uh, it would be good uh, to see a good turnout for that there. Also next Sunday, our New Year communion service, we will uh, meet for worship and then celebrate communion at the end of the service together. And we can we encourage all uh, to come along uh, to that service uh, as well. So lots of other announcements there to do with YPC, uh, and of course the important announcement there to do with uh, the accounts and the free will offering and so on, if you please take heed to, to all of those things uh, that are applicable uh, to you. I also welcome those who will be listening to uh, this service via the CD uh, internet and of course our YouTube channel. And I, so it's good uh, that they can join uh, via those means and we trust that they too uh, will know something of God's blessing as they listen to this service. Our flowers today have been put on by Robert uh, and Gemma Hawthorne, and as always, we thank uh, them for that uh, as well. We meet uh, to worship God, uh, to lead us into our worship. We're going to sing in a moment or two, a little town of Bethlehem. We're still uh, in our Christmas season uh, as such, although that's obviously coming to a close uh, today. But to, to lead us into our worship as we think about that, uh, Carl, we're about to sing I'm going to read a couple of verses from Micah chapter 5, uh, verses 2 and 4, uh, where the, the prophet says this, But you, Bethlehem, Epaphra, you, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they will live securely for then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth. That great prophecy, prophesying the coming of the Savior. And we're going to sing uh, this carol based on those verses. O little town of Bethlehem, I still we see thee lie. Let's stand and let's worship God together.
Let's just still ourselves and come before the Lord in prayer. Let's commit our time of worship to him uh, together. Let's, let's pray. And Father God, as we come uh, to you here this morning, and this the last Sunday of the year, and as we reflect on the year that has just passed, Father, we want to come with thankfulness in our hearts and indeed praise on our lips because of your faithfulness to us. As we ponder the many situations that we've faced in our lives, especially those that have affected us personally, surely we can't but help see your your hand guiding and, and helping us along the way can't help but see your love for us manifesting itself in the, the outworking of so many of those circumstances that we have encountered. We thank you, our Father, that for the fact that you have in the past and you continue today to seek out your people, to pardon us, to save us, to lead us, and to guide us through this life. Father, we, want to, we simply want to thank you that through Jesus that we can indeed call you Father, that we can call Jesus Lord of our lives. And so we bring our humble thanks and praise to you here today. And yet, Father, even with all the assurances and promises that we have from your word, declaring your faithfulness to us, Well, it can sometimes appear that we can doubt you, we can turn away from you, we can look for guidance elsewhere when we have choices and decisions to make in our lives. Confess that we so often look to the world for guidance when we know all too well that we should be turning to you. So often swayed by the promises that the world offers And in truth, we know that it's a world that can't offer us anything. We're bombarded by a world that seems to offer so much, yet in reality has nothing of lasting value to offer at all. The world and all its enticements rather feed into insignificance when compared to the glory and majesty of you, our our mighty creator, God. So, Father, we pray that you'd forgive us for those times when we've been enticed. Forgive us for those times when we've even been entrapped by the things of the world, when we've been distracted away from you. We pray that in, in your power, the power of your spirit, you'd remake us, you'd remold us, that you'd refocus our minds and our hearts instead of looking to the world or to ourselves. We would put Christ in his rightful place on the throne. That we would look to a future living for Christ and for him alone. So Father, bless our time of worship together. Lord, we pray for a movement of your spirit amongst us even here today. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to turn to God's word uh, together now. We're going to be reading uh, from the book of Philippians again. You'll know over the past uh, seven or eight weeks we've been, well, we had been looking at Philippians and we've taken a little break from it uh, to focus on the Christmas story, but now uh, we're jumping back in uh, to the book of Philippians. We've looked at at lots of things throughout uh, our series on it so far. We want to finish off chapter 2 today. We're going to read from Philippians chapter 2, reading from verse 19 through to the end of the chapter, uh, verse 30. If you've picked up one of the, the Bibles on the way in, it's on page 1179. Let's read uh, God's Word uh, together. I hope in the Lord to send Timothy to you soon, that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one else like him who will show genuine concern for your welfare. For everyone looks out for their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. 
But you know that Timothy has proved himself because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him as soon as I see how things go with me. I am confident in the Lord that I myself will come soon. But I think it is necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus, my brother, co-worker, and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger, whom you sent to take care of my needs. For he longs for all of you and is distressed because you heard he was ill. Indeed, he was ill and almost died. But God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but also on me, to spare me sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I am all the more eager to send eager to send him so that when you see him again, you may be glad and I may have less anxiety. So then, welcome him in the Lord with great joy and honor people like him because he almost died for the work of Christ. He risked his life to make up for the help you yourselves could not give me. I end our reading there at the end of the chapter and trust that God will speak to us through it later on together. I'm going to take my glasses off so I can see you again. Any young folk want to come up to the front today? I know we're, we're down in numbers a little bit today. It's that sort of period between Christmas and the, the new year. Um, but it'll be good to just the two of you. Any other young at heart want to come up now? You give me a wee minute till I walk down. I better bring my sheets with me or I'll forget where I'm at and what I'm doing. to get my wee seat out and bring my wee lunch bag with me. Somebody thought I brought my lunch with me today, so it's going to be a long sermon if I get a lunch with me, so get comfortable. It's all lonely up here today, isn't it? Just just the three of us, but sure is good anyway, isn't it? Did you enjoy Christmas? Yeah. You have a good time over Christmas? Yeah. And we're really glad it's all over. No, I am so glad Christmas is over and we can get back to normal again. It's just a terrible time of the year, isn't it? No school, lots of food and presents and all that. And it's good to get that all behind us, isn't it? It's not. We'd like it to be Christmas all the time, wouldn't we? It's not the song. I wish it could be Christmas every day. Hmm? Do we wish it could be Christmas every day? Well, so do I, in a very different way. Tell me, have you got your tree and decorations down yet? No, but your Christmas was away last week. You've still got your decorations up. You're going to have to get them down, aren't you? When are you going to take them down? Don't know, soon. Well, listen, I have a little challenge for you when you go to take your decorations down. And it's something I have in this bag, and it's something I done last year whenever I took my decorations down. And it helps us remember just what I've said about it being Christmas every day. Because, you see, when I took my decorations down last year, everything was packed away, everything was put in its boxes, and it was all taken up to the attic and put away for the rest of the year. Brilliant. And then, of course, I went to do the housework. <laughs> what are you laughing at? I got the hoover out to do all the hoovering and stuff. And I moved one of the chairs to hoover in behind the chair. And what do you think I found? A Christmas decoration. A wee bauble. A wee bobble had fallen off this tree and it had sneaked in behind the chair. And do you think, was it worthwhile going the whole way up to the attic just for one wee bobble? Not really, sure it's not. And I thought, right, what am I going to do with it? Will I just throw it in the bin? 
Sure, it'd just be handy to throw it in the bin and get rid of it. But you know what I decided to do? You see, we have had a silly tape on it there. What I done was I took my little Christmas decoration and I put a bit of silly tape on it and silly taped it to one of the shelves in my study, right beside my desk. And that hangs all year beside my desk. So it feels like Christmas every day. And you know why I'm encouraging you to do that? Because it is Christmas every day. Christmas, what do we celebrate at Christmas? Jesus being born. And do you think, is that really just a celebration for one day? It's not really, isn't it? We focus on one day, we focus on Christmas Day, and we make a big celebration of that. And that's good. And it's good to celebrate that. But the fact that Jesus was born changes our lives each and every day, all 365 days of the year. When we know and love Jesus as our Savior and Lord, it makes a difference in our lives every day. And that's what that reminds me of as it hangs in my study every day, that Jesus is important. Jesus' birth is important every single day of the year, not just for one day when we got all our presents and we get our big turkey and ham dinner and all. It's important every day. It's important to look and to focus on Jesus every day of our lives. It's important to come to know him and to spend time with him every day. And that's a good little reminder. So do you see, when you start taking the decorations down, I want you to take one, and I want you to stick it up in your bedroom. Are they allowed to do that? <laughs> there you are, you're allowed to do it. <laughs> you get a nod. Keep a little Christmas decoration. It's a good thing for all of us to do, not just for the children and the young people to do. It's good for us all to do. We're reminded of Jesus' birth every day because we wish it could be Christmas every day and it really is when we know and love Jesus. Let me pray. Let me pray with us. Let's pray. Let's pray together. And then we'll sing your song. Father, we thank you for Christmas. We thank you for what it means to us. Father, we thank you that we celebrate that special day uh, to celebrate Jesus' birth. But Father, we recognize that it's more than just a one-day event. We thank you that Jesus changes us and transforms us when we put our faith and trust in him and that that means a change every day of the year. And Lord, we pray that you would help us, both young and old, to focus on Jesus every day of our lives. Not just the one day, but every day. Lord, help us to follow him and to look to him for all things as we grow in our faith and as we grow and walk through our lives. So will you help us? Lead us and guide us, we pray. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Right, we're going to sing uh, together. We're going to sing uh, your song. We're going to focus on Christmas. Not on Christmas decorations, but on Christmas bells. Christmas bells, Christmas bells. Ring them out today. Do you know it? Good. you going to teach it to me? No? Let's all stand and let's sing together. Christmas bells.
That's okay. Hey, sit down. Here. Anybody's birthday today? I forgot to ask this. No, it's just not. What about this here? Here. You'd only give off about me if I didn't. George would be giving off to me if I didn't offer you one of his sweets, wouldn't he? As the children go back uh, to, to their seats, uh, we're going to continue worshipping God uh, through our, our offering. Uh, we come with thankful hearts for all uh, that God has done for us and in response. Uh, we come with our offering now. So your morning offering uh, will now be received. <laughs> Let's just pray together. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come uh, and to bring this offering to you. Father, we thank you for the health, the strength to be here, uh, to gather, to worship you, and Lord, as part of that worship, uh, to give something back of what you have given us. So we pray that you would bless this offering, that you would use it for your glory and that of your Son and our Saviour Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. continue in that attitude of prayerfulness together as we come now to a time uh, of prayers of intercession as we take time to pray uh, for others uh, and as I always do I encourage you as the Lord leads you and speaks to you to bring uh, those different situations and those different people uh, to him in prayer but allow me uh, to lead you uh, first and foremost in this time of prayer together let's let let's pray our uh, father God is Well, as we prayed earlier, we are so thankful that as we stand at the brink of the start of another new year, we can look back and see how you have led us and guided us in the past, especially in the past year. We're so thankful for your mercy, your love, your watchful care and your protection as we have traversed the many troubling paths each of us have had to walk along this past year. Come in awe and wonder that you, the Almighty God, do see and do know each of our troubles, each of our situations. Come in awe and wonder to know that you're there for us, to call on for strength and comfort when we find ourselves in the midst of all that life seems to throw at us. Father, surely your love and care for us is never more apparent when we think about this wonderful privilege we have, both here together as your people, 
as we've bowed and stilled ourselves together in prayer and of course in our our own personal prayer times with you each and every day to have this wonderful privilege to talk to you and to take time to to intercede for our own trials and troubles to take time to to intercede for those in our families here and worldwide and to know that you the almighty God hear us and promise to answer us we thank you Father for your faithfulness to us as, as we have done that you have answered our prayers time and time again and yet as we often do we have to confess that we might not always see or recognize your plan in the midst of the trial but as we look back surely we can see your hand at work in so many of those situations and father at the close of this year we we want to pray for all those who have lost loved ones over the past year as we remember the the many that we've loved who have left us and reached their journey's end we remember and pray for those left behind Father, we know that those losses are felt especially more keenly at this time of year. So we pray for that strength and comfort that we so easily talk about, but that we know is just as easily found when we turn to you in faith and trust, knowing you as our our God and our Saviour. And Father, we want to pray as well for those from our fellowship who are ill or unwell at the moment. We thank you for those who have known something of your healing and restoration of their health. We pray that all who find themselves in the midst of illness uh, at the minute would know something of that healing too. Again, Father, we know it's a difficult time, this time of year, to be laid up, to be in hospital, to be suffering illness or infirmity of any kind. But again, we look to you. We look to you and your grace, your mercy in those different and difficult situations. Lord God, we come thankful for the blessings that you've bestowed on each of us and and this fellowship over the past year. Lord, as you've worked out your purposes and the lives of of your people and and our family here. Father, we're amazed. Amazed yet thankful, blessed, humbled to coin just a few of the sentiments that we feel. But Lord, even though we're amazed at what you can and have done and continue to do, I we pray for an even greater work of your Spirit amongst us in the year that lies ahead. So we begin that new year in just a few days' time. We pray for ourselves as your people in this place. Pray for continued growth your guidance for us as a fellowship we pray that we would all grow closer in our walk with you we would all grow in our knowledge of you that we might be that beacon of life shining from this place attracting others to you that they too might come to know you and join us as your fellowship of believers Father, we pray for the pathways, the estates, in our community. We pray for the people in our pews. Lord, in your almighty and saving power, will you continue to work in hearts and minds? Will you draw many to the truth of the gospel? Or will you save them? 
And will you continue to lead us and guide us? Will you use us for your glory in this place? We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to stand uh, together uh, once again. We're going to sing our next piece of praise, our next carol. It is the first Noel. Let's stand and let's sing to God's praise. Uh, at this time of the year, it's, it's popular, isn't it, with many folk to, to look back and to reflect on the year that has just gone past, and of course to, to look to the future. Uh, and then we, we all resolve to, to change certain things in our lives. We make the, the dreaded New Year's resolutions, uh, which is, well, we all know uh, are easier to, to make uh, than to keep. Uh, and one of the most popular ones that you usually hear about uh, is New Year, New Me, uh, which of course is about an intention uh, to change ourselves and our behavior uh, for the better. And as we have journeyed so far uh, with Paul 
in this letter uh, to his friends in, in Philippi is not exactly what he's been calling them to do. To change. And to change uh, for the better. Of course, there has been that call uh, to unity that we've looked at at the heart of it all. But there is also this call uh, to grow, this call to maturity in our faith, uh, to grow more and more uh, like Jesus all the time. And of course, we know it's a continuing journey, isn't it? We're always on that journey. We are never the finished product, are we? So we have to work at it. Whether we're adding inches to our height uh, or to our belt size, whether we're growing the first hair on our chins or we're waving bye-bye to the last of them on the top of our heads, we're all on a journey. We're all still growing in, in that spiritual sense. If you remember back a few weeks ago, uh, we saw the call from Scripture that we're supposed to have that, that attitude or, or that mindset uh, of Christ. And now if that's the standard we're called to, if the standard we're called to uh, to reach is Jesus himself, uh, then surely we have to recognize that we all have a long way to go, self-included. If Jesus is the bar then the bar is set very high for us, isn't it? But Paul recognizes that. He sets the bar for the Philippians to become more like Jesus. But he knows that it's something uh, that they can't attain to themselves. He knows that whilst getting a glimpse at how Jesus handles things in his mind to, to help us grow and mature spiritually, there's nothing better. There's nothing like having a, a living, breathing role model uh, to look to uh, and to emulate. Someone who's, who's just a normal person like we are, living out their lives in the world. Someone who is just like us. They struggle with the trials and the temptations of life, yet their hearts beat so instinctively and graciously that we can sense the very heartbeat and character of Jesus himself through them. Through them, we can see Jesus. It's not all how we would all like to be. Through them, we see Jesus and how they treat others, how they react to adversity, uh, where they invest their time and their energy uh, as they, they grow up as such in, in the nitty gritty of everyday life. And so in these closing verses of chapter 2 that we read there, we get a glimpse at just that. Three examples of real people. And each one of them exemplifying a character trait that can help us in our journey of faith. And those three characters... Well, we have Paul himself, we have his assistant, Timothy, and then we have the Philippians' own messenger, Epaphroditus. Of course, just like us as well, none of those three can or do fully match the original. None of them are fully mature. Paul himself admits he never attains the goal. But each of them reflect Jesus to the Philippians and to us. They show us that those character traits aren't just some impossible goal that we've been set, but that they're something that each and every one of us can achieve. So we're going to take a look at the three of them together. Firstly, Paul the submissive servant. Is that what's shown there, is it? Sorry, I'm just checking because I can't see the TVs. <laughs> As Paul begins to tell the church about how he's planning to send Timothy to them, there's something about submission that's worth noting. It's worth noting how Paul places his hopes and plans for Timothy and ultimately his own plans to go back to Philippi to see his friends. This is all in God's hands. Submission 
to God's sovereignty. He trusts totally and confidently in the sovereign will of God. This is another one of those occasions that we can overlook an important word or a phrase so easily if we're not careful. When Paul talks about this, when he mentions Timothy's and his own visit to the Philippians, the complete sentence is encased in that deep awareness of the sovereign will of God. Recognition from the very start to the end that the Lord controls all those hopes and plans. The apostle's perspective on the plans that he's making flow so naturally from the nib of his pen that we can be sure that uh, that they flow just as naturally from his lips and, and from the very depths of his heart. I hope in the Lord Jesus, he says, and I trust in the Lord at the end. Paul says them so naturally that we could easily overlook those simple phrases that express that deep conviction about who was really in control of of every aspect of his life. I hope in the Lord Jesus. And everything is in the Lord. What Paul plans and what he hopes for are always in the Lord's will. Paul is a, a, a model in a sense of the supremely submissive servant, the one who came yet not to do his own will, but that of the Father who sent him. And we know in our own minds that as Christians we are supposed to do the same. We are supposed to acknowledge or or attach that qualification to all our hopes and plans too, isn't it? God willing. Or as many do quote the Latin DV, we attach it to all our plans. But often, wouldn't it be true to say that we're not as confident and assured as we see Paul here? Of course, we're not alone. Scripture is full of warnings about making our plans and and leaving God out of the picture. James, in his letter, gives a very grave warning to those who make plans for the future without God. Instead, he says, "You you should say, if the Lord wills, we will do this or we will do that. We don't make plans for ourselves. We make plans if the Lord wills. The problem is our, our hearts have to be molded to match the reality of our words. And what we see in Paul was a, a deep consciousness of Christ's sovereignty and control and the willingness to submit to it in in every circumstance in his life. He was completely aware that everything within his control and outside of his control belonged in the hands of God. It belonged to Jesus. With those simple words in the Lord that begin and close this sentence, Paul is the role model of what submission really means for us in our daily planning uh, and routine decisions of life. The challenge, of course, is is how does that impact us? How does that impact our planning for the future? Do we recognize that everything is in the Lord's will? Our hopes, our dreams, our careers, our husbands, our wives, our promotions, our retirements, whatever it is, we must submit it all to the Lord's will. If we're becoming a a spiritual grown-up like Paul, well, we will. We'll be seeking to make our plans with humility, always aware that it is the Lord who has both the right and the wisdom to overrule our choices. It is the Lord who has the right and the wisdom to redirect our paths as he sees fit for the good of his people. The submissive servant. Second role model then is Timothy. The selfless servant. For Paul, Timothy was the the epitome 
of considering others better than himself. Selfless for other people. Timothy shared that that real inner emotional struggle for others' well-being, just like Paul. Again, the wording Paul uses here gives us gives a real depth to the common heartfelt union these two men had for the people in Philippi. To real equality of mind and soul, a special father-son kind of bond that he talks about here, one that sets young Timothy head and shoulders above the rest as far as Paul is concerned. Paul even says there's nobody else like him who takes a genuine interest in the welfare of others. Timothy is selfless. His heart aches with Paul's as they hear about all these different reports coming from Philippi. And he is deeply concerned about them. Yes, we know there have been plenty of encouragements about the believers working together to spread the gospel there. But Paul, as we have seen as we have traveled this journey with him, is still very conscious of this disease that he has diagnosed as a danger to the church, this self-centeredness that many seem to have, this self-centeredness which has made them inclined to look out for their own interests and completely disregard others. In young Timothy, the selfless servant man would be the antidote as such for the disease. His genuine concern for them. In his genuine concern for them, they would see firsthand a man who would seek the interests of Jesus and the gospel before all else, which of course has the welfare of others inbuilt in it. In effect, what Paul's saying, he says, when I, when I send you Timothy, in him you will see the attitude you should have towards each other. He's a miniature Jesus as such. A king who didn't look out for himself, but became a selfless servant for you. That's the mindset that you should have. That's the mindset you should be developing to grow. Watch this man closely as he serves with you in the church. And that's another key point Paul's very careful to remind them about here and remind us about here. Timothy is there to serve with them. He's there to serve with them. Yes, he is a figurehead. He is an example. He is a leader in the wings, if we want to put it that way. But they all have a role to play as they serve Christ's church together with each other. He stands out in this selflessness. And yes, he is there to lead, but he is to lead with the people. Timothy is a wonderful, practical, real example to us to help us emulate a a specific characteristic of our Lord and Savior Jesus. And friends, if you look around this fellowship, If you look around this place week by week, day by day, as so much happens here, you will see other Timothys here as well. You will see other selfless servants who are as equally worth watching and, of course, serving with. The call is to watch and to serve together. And that call is as, is as applicable and vital for us to do today as it was for these believers in Philippi. And together, we can serve God and serve each other as we, as we grow together. Submissive servant, selfless servant. The last example Paul sets out for the Philippians uh, and for us here is Epaphroditus, the suffering servant. Paul says he's going to send Epaphroditus back to them immediately, he says. In fact, it'll be him who delivers this very letter that Paul's writing as soon as the ink dries on the papyrus. 
Why, is he, why does he want to send him specifically? Well, for one, he's one of their own. He is the one who came from Philippi to Rome with that much needed aid for Paul in prison. He was their messenger and minister to Paul uh, as he stayed there to help Paul in other words, in other ways. But of course, we read here that there had been a problem. He had fallen seriously ill and news that he was at death's door had got back to the church. And naturally, the folk there are, are, are very concerned about him. And of course, Epaphroditus himself is very distressed because his friends are in distress. So he wants to get back and to reassure them that he's getting better. So Paul sees a real urgency to send them back to them as quickly as possible so that these fears and concerns could be alleviated. But also, also so that they could see that by God's grace and power, how well he has recovered from this life-threatening condition so that they could rejoice and give thanks to God for his goodness to Epaphroditus. But again, Paul, I think, has a kind of ulterior motive in mind here. The Philippians need another role model, one where they could see what it really means to face the most desperate trials of, of everyday life but with the mindset of Christ. Paphrodites had faced, faced death, almost. Almost gave his life serving the gospel. And in him, the Philippians would see the reality of the, the submission They would see the reality of the selflessness and they would see the suffering. They would see the reality of the submission of Jesus to the will of God in Paul as he committed all his plans and purposes to God. They would see the selflessness of Jesus reflected in Timothy's concern for their well-being over and above his own. And in this last man, they would also see and understand the sacrifice that one man can make. Sacrifice that one of their own was prepared to make for the cause of Christ. Paul can't command this man any higher, could he? You can see what Paul thought of this ordinary man from from Philippi. There we say this man, Epaphroditus, wasn't anything special. He wasn't an apostle. There's no indication that he was even a leader in the church. But to Paul, he's a a brother, a fellow worker, a soldier, a messenger and a minister. Paul is really setting them up as a prime example of someone who's growing in their faith and someone who is well worth watching. (coughs) Excuse me. He has given his all in serving. He has put his life on the line for the work of Christ. And so again, Paul says, look at him. Learn from him as he serves with you. The lesson for us, well, look at these men as well. Look at Paul. Look at Timothy. Look at Epaphroditus and learn from them. Look at the godly people serving around you in this fellowship. Let them show you the reality of God's control in every aspect of your life. Let them show you how to open your heart to the cares and concerns of others. Let them show you the courage and sacrifice involved in giving your all in the service of God and of each other. But above all, look through these role models and let them show you Jesus, the submissive, the selfless, and the suffering servant, the Son of God who loved you and gave himself for you. 
new year, new me. What better New Year's resolution could you set for yourself? What better way to end one year and move into a new one than to resolve to take this call seriously? Take this call to change and be transformed seriously. Commit yourself to that change to grow and mature more and more as disciples of the Lord Jesus. New year, new me. What will the new you look like in the new year? Let me pray with you. Let's pray. (coughs) Father, as always, as as we look at your word, Lord, we thank you for how it is, your living word that it speaks to us even today. Father, we thank you for these examples that we see in your word. These folk who have gone before us, who set that example for us, give us that glimpse of Jesus. Father, we thank you for those you've placed amongst us in this fellowship, who just emulate the qualities of Jesus as well. And Father, we pray that you would help us to learn from them, help us to learn from each other, help us to grow in our faith. That through us, your kingdom might be extended in this place. Through us, the name of Jesus might be glorified. Through us, your name might be lifted high not just in this place, but in the world around us. So will you help us? Will you bless us? Will you speak to us? Each one we pray. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Going to to close with our last hymn, as I said, we're fearing away from our Christmas carols now as we finish and of course we're going to sing Be Thou My Vision O Lord of My Heart which is a hymn and a prayer I suppose as such it's a prayer for us we sing it as a prayer at the close of this year uh, to move into the the new year asking that God uh, would help us that God would lead us and God would guide us in all things let's stand and let's worship God together
Let's pray. And now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. We pray the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit would be with each of us now and forevermore. Amen.